Hello, Pod Fam, and hello, Rachel. How are you this evening? I am good, Laura. How are you doing? I'm good. Drinking one of my favorites, honey lavender rooibos tea. So it's a good evening so far. I love that. I really need to buy some lavender tea because every time you bring it up, I'm always like, ooh, that sounds delicious. And I'm just editing an episode right now where you were talking about your la la lavender. Oh, that one's also, I was like, you know, making the choice. I couldn't decide was it honey lavender tonight or la la lavender tonight. I just need something super soothing. However, mm-hmm. you don't really need an actual tea with mm-hmm. lavender in it. If you mm-hmm. have a lavender plant out in your garden, you can just uh, snip some leaves off and throw it right into some hot water. And there's your lavender tea right there. Amazing. Is that your tea fact today or do you have? We're going to make that my tea fact today. All right. That's Laura's tea fact today. You heard yes. it here first. Fresh teas. We're going to call them fresh herbal teas. Yes. Just go out to the garden, take a little snip snip. But today I have a chamomile tea. Oh, that's also very soothing. Yeah, I'm aiming to fall asleep like right after we finish recording. So I am chugging it down. Same here. I got an early morning tomorrow. Got to be on the road at 630. So I need to go to bed and not stay up watching Outlander all night as I have been for the past few nights. Yeah, fair enough. Outlander can be pretty addictive, honestly. So I'm so glad when you told me that you were watching it today because I'm just eagerly awaiting the next season and no one that I know actually watches it except for my mother. (laughs) Oh, your mother watches that show? Oh my goodness. Oh my God. My mom is the biggest Outlander fan. Don't get me started. Oh my God. She used to to read the books. Like she was a diehard book fan. And uh, that's like the one show that once she finishes a season, she's like eagerly waiting for the next one. And yeah. And there's like certain things where I'm like, mom, this show is a bit fucked up. And she's like, it's fine. It's fine. That's just what it was like back then. I'm like, it's still messed up. Yeah. You know what? There have been, especially like I'm I'm just finished, I think, episode one or two of season two. Um, Mm -hmm. So in season one, like there were some extremely disturbing moments. And (sighs) finally, I had to like fast forward through a few because I was busy trying to do something else. But I was like Mm -hmm. also disturbed about what was going on on my screen. And yep. I was like, oh dear, I need to not be in this mindset right now because I'm trying to f- pay attention to what I'm doing. Yeah. From what I remember about Lander season one, it's very accurate to the book. So I'm like, damn. Wow. Girl. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to watch something where it's like the book TV show comparison. Yeah. I can't speak to season three onward, but book one and two is very accurate to the seasons. But anyway, Outlander aside... Not what we meant to talk about to this evening. Not what we meant to talk about, but I'm just, I love that show. Oh, but somewhat related because it involves time traveling and sense of home, Yeah, which happens to be what we're talking about today. Yeah. So obviously a bit different than traveling through some Scottish rocks, but we wanted to discuss a sense of home and creating a sense of home when you become an adult. Because I don't know about you, but I have definitely gone through some years of my life and lived in some apartments where I felt very homesick. Yes, and it's like a feeling that you're homesick, but you don't even know where home is. And it's really hard because you're almost searching for something that you might not have. And Mm -hmm. I think it's more relevant to young adults and no one really talks about it. And if you think about it, there's so many changes that are going on in your late teens and 20s because Mm -hmm. you're graduating high school, you might be moving to a different place, you might be going off to school, and Mm -hmm. it really shakes everything that you might have known when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. When you are a kid and say you go to camp, When you're homesick, you miss your house and you miss your parents. But when you turn 22, you're not homesick for a place. You're homesick for that feeling of safety and a place where you're welcome and fully allowed to just rest and be your true self. Yes, and almost a place that you can call your own. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. just kind of a feeling that I have had. No, I agree with that, especially when you were in school. And I don't know if you felt this way in college where it just felt like you were the tenant that lived in that apartment at that current time 
but it never became a home. Yeah, I definitely can relate to that. So when I went to school, I actually originally lived with a family friend Mm -hmm. and it was in a a really nice house and I had like my own bedroom. And of course we just shared the rest of the house. Mm -hmm. So I was fairly comfortable there. Like I really made my room my own and that was an okay transition for me. Mm -hmm. But what happened going into my fourth year, I believe, um, my fourth and fifth year, she was moving for love, which I love her for. She followed her heart to Boston and she's living a beautiful life on the coast. Yes. (laughs) I'm so happy for my city mom. Oh my God. It's like the love story that you just want to hear about. I didn't even know that. You never told me that story before. Did I never tell you that? Oh yeah. No, No, I love that. It's super sweet. It was a man who she knew like before her husband and Mm -hmm. they reconnected but he happened to be from Boston and so yeah she picked up her whole life and moved there and they've been together oh god for like I think she's lived there for like seven years now like a crazy amount of time that's amazing that's like a Nicholas Sparks book it really is yeah like even has a little coastal town like what more do you want amazing yeah um so anyway (laughs) I a little little deviation there yeah yeah like I would have stayed in that house my whole undergrad we got along so well and she just provided that comfort that I was very used to in my Mm -hmm. own home but then when I moved um you know I got the apartment you know right downtown the city I had uh, a friend who was a roommate and Mm -hmm. you know another place we did make it our own yeah but it didn't have that same feeling for Mm -hmm. me you know, like you were just saying, the feeling of just being the tenant for now, Mm -hmm. that's how I felt. You know, what what do you think of your school experience? Um, School was difficult for me because I moved to a school that was about three hours away and I did not know anybody there except I think I did have a cousin there briefly, but we weren't super close. And every so often I would go and see her, but, you know, she didn't bring that warm hug feeling that I was used to from other members of my family and residence was tough because you know I definitely bought all the things and made a nice little bedroom for myself but I came to realize that so much of what made me feel safe and at home was the people around me so Mm -hmm. when I was that age it was the farm that we grew up at like yeah you my other friends there our trainer and my horse, that was where I would go to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And that was now three hours away. Yes. And for at least two, three months, I didn't make any friends that I could relate to. Some of them did come later, but it definitely felt for somebody that is very relationship oriented. And that's where my sense of family and home comes from. It felt very isolating. Mm -hmm. And second year was a bit of the same thing. And I remember you came with me to visit this apartment, but the apartment that I moved into was all furnished exactly the same. It kind of felt like you were living in an Ikea showroom. Right. And also that place never really became home for me because the person I was supposed to live in it with didn't come back to school that year. So it was like, it was already tainted for me. Yeah. Your one connection that you had all of a sudden was gone. Yeah, so it was tough, but I did make new ones, and that's how I wound up joining my sorority in the in my third year of school, which created a weird mix of I felt at home at school, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. So I definitely had a home within my sorority and with those girls, but the apartment itself that I was living in, I think I guess I just didn't spend enough time there, but it definitely didn't feel homey to me it just kind of felt like okay I'm here for two years and then I'm gonna dip maybe it was partially because like we didn't decorate it together and maybe like didn't vacuum as much as we should have but I kind of just felt like it was my roommate's apartment and I just had a bedroom there right I was definitely more of a social butterfly like I like being on campus so that's partially my thing because I didn't make it a home for myself but it definitely felt like when I was leaving I was like okay Sayonara. Bye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You really had no connection there. Yeah. And how did you feel like after school? So when I found my apartment in the city, which I lived in for, was that two years? Um, 
I gave it up after two years, but maybe I was actually functionally living in it for a year and a half. I think so. Yeah, about a year and a half. You actually lived there? Yeah. And that was definitely the first time as an adult where I felt like it was my home. Every time I would come visit my parents' house, I'd always say, okay, I'm going back home now. Mm -hmm. And I definitely like went off with turning it into a nest. Like my bedroom was very much my own. It was like a nice little safe haven that I had. And the girls that I was living with, like we worked together to really make the communal spaces somewhere that you would want to be. So we had like a nice accent wall of pictures, like all this nice furniture. There were animals around. So physically, it was home, right? And for a time, like emotionally, mentally, it definitely was as well. But I realized that as I started to move forward in life and kind of outgrow it, the feeling of home kind of departed. Mm -hmm. It was like, yes, it was homey. And I definitely had all my furniture everywhere and like I loved it, but the feeling wasn't there. So it kind of turned into a bit of a shell again. I just had outgrown Mm -hmm. where I was. Right. And I kind of just learned from that, that it's not necessarily a physical place where you lay your head that is your home, but it's more a feeling, at least for me, it's a feeling of, okay, I'm carrying this with me and I also have these people around me. So can you relate to that? (laughs) That was a bit emotional. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I think I have like a similar perspective, but a little bit different. So post-grad for me, I actually ended up moving back home and my parents separated when I was about 16. So my family home that I grew up, okay, like I kind of lived all over the place. So I've always been very comfortable in a lot of different spaces. Yes. and But like my childhood home that we had always hung on to and that was like home base for us that was no more Mm -hmm. and that was a feeling in itself of letting go of almost that time period that we had been in that house Mm -hmm. and you know my mom moved a little bit more out into the country and my dad was just you know one town over Mm -hmm. and in both of their homes you know going back to the emotional sense I had that, that connection you know like they're my parents and There's just something about walking into my mother's house where like I feel not like a kid again, but I get that sense of just like, okay, I'm in a place where, you know, I'm loved and supported Mm -hmm. and same thing at my dad's house, you know, you walk in and he's always there. So Mm -hmm. emotionally I had that, but when I graduated school, I was like 24, I don't know, it was 2016, however old I was in 2016. And it it was kind of hard, like in the same sense where you felt you were outgrowing the space a mm-hmm. little bit, I kind of would go back and forth between both of my parents and, mm-hmm. you know, my room was whatever. It was how I wanted it to be. But yeah. the rest of the house, you know, it wasn't really like my space. Yeah. Like you didn't you know? necessarily have creative freedom to change the living room as you wanted it. No. And not that there's anything wrong with how the houses are but Mm -hmm. you know like it always kind of felt like oh I'm at my dad's house oh I'm at my mom's house you know I was never at like my house yes so that like especially as time went on I found that like a little bit harder because it was just like that I don't know maybe that's just a factor of being in your 20s where you're just like oh I just want to be like out there in like my own place and you know everything's Mm -hmm. exactly how I want it um Mm -hmm. so I think that was a little bit of the sense of like I struggled more with the physical yes. than the emotional. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as we've mentioned many times in our podcast, um, my boyfriend and I moved in together in fall of 2020. Yes. And it's been going well. However, it wasn't the original situation that we had planned for. So things mm-hmm. things changed a little bit. So we had been looking at other places, but we ended up moving into the townhome that mm-hmm. his mother has. And it's almost that same sense yes. a little bit. Like I have the emotional connection, you know, I'm with my boyfriend and we support each other and I have that sense of home. Mm-hmm. But again, in the physical space, like, you know, yes, we're allowed to decorate it however we want, mm-hmm. but what I'm almost looking for is like a blank canvas. Does that make sense? Oh, hundred percent. It does. I know exactly how you feel. And even in my places, and this is kind of how I can relate to you on that, where, you know, in my school apartment, 
my one roommate had basically brought all the furniture. Yeah. So it was kind of hers. Mm-hmm. Where in my apartment in the city, one of my good friends held the lease of it. So it's kind of like I moved into an apartment that somebody else was renting. And I definitely had a lot more creative freedom. Like I could say like, oh, like let's try this or let's try this. But there would be times where I would go away for like two, three weeks to go visit my family. Maybe it was Christmas or a little vacation in the summer and stuff. And I would come back and the furniture would be reorganized or there would be a new desk or new pictures on the wall that I felt like I didn't have input on. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was like I got closer to that feeling of it being mine, but it definitely wasn't a blank canvas. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I'm glad my point hopefully is like making sense. No, it does. When you're a child, you don't necessarily think so much about how do I want this space to be because you care more about being safe and with your family. Yeah. You're like, oh, I got the toy I wanted. Great. (laughs) you know. Yeah. And in a way, like your toy room is the way that you want it to be. It has all your toys. Yeah, exactly. Where when you become an adult and you outgrow that sense of your childhood home, which as you said, is always going to be there when you go back and visit your parents. Yes. But there's another part of you that gets brought out when you're trying to find a home because you want that emotional feeling of like, yes, I'm safe here. But also, I'm an adult and I want to nest. Mm -hmm. I want to build my life as my own person, not as someone that just lives in somebody else's house. Yeah. And that's just kind of like how I feel at times for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in the kitchen, like I have my own kitchen stuff that's very nice. And, you know, I used it in my apartment, but really it's been sitting in a box for many years now. And even though we live together here, I still have not unpacked that box. Yeah. Because I know at the end of the day, like, we're the ones who are going to be leaving. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, well, what's the point? You know, I'm going to just have to pack this all up again. You know, I might Mm -hmm. as well keep it nice in the box. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And Mm -hmm. it's one of those situations where it, like, works for right now and then, you know, we do have a plan. But that's kind of where my sense of home is. And you know, very much like you, the barn was the one consistent thing in my life growing up because, you know, my parents, we moved around quite a bit, you know, within the province and outside. My dad worked abroad for many years, Mm -hmm. but always the barn family was there. Mm -hmm. So when Mm -hmm. I think of like that strong emotional connection to a place that's home, that's where Mm -hmm. my mind goes. You know, the physical place has always been there. The people have always been there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Like, home is not always what you think it's going to be. Sometimes it is the people or something completely different. Mm-hmm. I feel like because I've been out of the farm for a while, just because of financial reasons and such, that's when I latched on to singing. Right. And I have like a really great relationship with my coach, and that's been probably has five, four years. Mm-hmm. Twenty eighteen for about four years. Is like even when I lived in the city, I was like, okay, financially, one lesson a week, this is something I can swing. I'll just drive an hour and I'll go to my lesson. So like it's been a consistent person and a consistent thing that makes me feel good and safe and just like I'm welcome to be myself that I have carried with me through, you know, everywhere that I've lived over the past four years. Right. And it's almost like while I – work to financially get back into a position where I can go back to riding. It's like holding that little spot. Mm -hmm. Fulfilling that need for you. Yes. And then one day I'll be able to go back to the farm too. And then I'll have both. Yeah, there you go. See, big, big family. A big family. I'll just have a giant, giant family. So yeah. Also like, damn, this is more emotional than I was expecting it to be. I kind of had a feeling it was going to go down this road when I was like, I know, make thinking about it today. Um, I know. It's good though. It's just getting it out in the open. And I think this is definitely an episode where, you know, we're not fully coming from a spot of wisdom. So, yes. like, you know, um, because we are still on this path of finding yes. home and whether mm-hmm. that's in the physical space or, you know, we seem to be doing okay emotionally on, on sense emotionally, of Emotionally, we're okay. <laughs> yeah. And that is just life, you know, you get into parts where everything is working and you have like, great place where you're living or whatever you need 
and then it mm-hmm. changes. So yeah, it's just that flexibility and just trying to find things that make you feel that sense of home. Mm-hmm. You know, do you have any suggestions that can help with that? If like if someone is feeling a little bit homeless, I'm going to say, <laughs> maybe not in the physical yeah. sense, but you know, in the uh, spiritual sense. Yeah, I do. But just on your note of like things just changing, life is insane. And when I think about what was home for me six months ago, it's entirely different than what it was three months ago. And now it's becoming different again. And I'm like, does it ever slow down? Yeah, I don't know. Does the change ever slow down? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not really sure. I, Yeah, I don't know. It is what it is. But yeah, I do have a couple of things. One of them And, you know, you can sub in whatever animal you want here. But I do have a little bunny rabbit who has been with me basically since I was 20 years old. He has lived in every single apartment with me Mm -hmm. and gone back with me to every visit to my parents. And he is like literally the most constant of constants in my life. So having him has been great. Of course, not everybody has a rabbit. So I'm going to move on from there. Yeah. Would you say that your horses help with that? Absolutely. Like that's definitely my grounding place. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've brought my horse down to the city before and that was okay, but like it was good to have him. But then I was just like, you know what? I don't have that sense of family, like the full sense of the family uh, with him being out of that barn. So, you know, I sent him back. Well, I had that experience too when I took Yeah, you did the exact her, same thing. When I took my horse away. And it was like I remember that where I was like turned me off of riding so much to a point where I literally went back to our trainer and said, like, I wanna sell my horse. And she's like, No, you don't. I remember that. You just wanna come home. Yeah. Yeah. And she was like, There's a stall open, just bring her home and I think like, unfortunately, we lost her a couple years ago, but I think I had like good two, three years where it was like such a renewed sense of loving riding. Yeah. Like you found your your home again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we're really lucky to have grown up with that. And I hope like everyone listening has had something that they can relate to that, that has been a constant in their life. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's rare and it's hard to find, but you know, it really does help. And yes, just getting away from that thought of like home is where you sleep (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. home is where where your heart lives as corny as that sounds it is yes but but yeah like my horses um you know I'm fortunate that I do live down in the city but it only takes me like a couple hours to Mm -hmm. go home so Mm -hmm. I get to kind of like revisit that all the time Mm -hmm. it's almost like my grounding and me like rooting to my to who I am as a person Yes, that really ties into like the next point that I wanted to make. And maybe you can help me rephrase this because I struggle to. But how I worded it was that not burning bridges whenever I close a chapter in my life. And that's Mm. not to say like you don't ruin a relationship. I'm more meaning like when I move away from my hometown for a while or say I have to take a break from the farm because financially it's not in my budget. I don't treat it like it's just a chapter in my past that I can never go back to. It's just somewhere that I'm like, okay, maybe right now I have to focus on other things, but I know that that home is always there to welcome me back. Yes. No, I think that's a really good point. And and I think you can almost see both sides of that where Mm -hmm. you should keep that bridge open and not make it a chapter of your past, as you said, or Mm -hmm. it's something you need to let go. Because that is wrecking your sense of home. You know, if you, Mm -hmm. you know, I hate if any of our listeners did come from a broken home or a very hard upbringing, you know, Mm -hmm. that is something you can walk away from. That doesn't have to be your home. You Mm -hmm. know, you can create your new home. Yep. So I I just see it it works both ways. You know, either you can go back to that or you Mm -hmm. can remove yourself entirely and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Damn, this is deep. I wasn't expecting. I'm like, you're like, I expected it to take this turn. And I'm like, I didn't. <laughs> now we're going to talk about houses. <laughs> now we're going to talk about houses. I thought we were going to talk about homes and apartments. But something that's been super important to me is, and uh, this podcast is literally a product of this, but keeping in close contact with those important friends in your life and also your family that help you feel grounded. 
people are the key and obviously like it depends on the friend like sometimes you might not connect with them for like a year at a time and but you feel at home with them Mm -hmm. but like with our friendship with you I've lived in so many different places and so have you but you're just a constant presence in my life where you know I could be on the other side of the world and suddenly I feel like we're having tea with your mom sort of thing yes like it just brings that feeling of like your home in movement Exactly. And, you know, I've got many friends that I might only talk to once a year or every few months. But when we pick up the phone or get together, you know, we're right back into that sense of uh, togetherness. Like Mm -hmm. no time has passed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think people are key to keep you grounded and rooted. Mm -hmm. that then it really doesn't matter where you are, especially in the world today. Like we're so globalized and especially if the past year and a half has taught us anything, you know, a lot of people had to be distant from their loved ones and, you know, it was really hard, Mm -hmm. but we also found ways to make it work. Honestly, if anything, it made me better at keeping in contact with people. Yeah. And I think it came down to the sense where we were going so fast before Mm -hmm. all of this and it really made us stop and realize you know you might be casually seeing that one person Mm -hmm. a couple times a week you know but then when that's taken away from you you realize how important people are to being home because people were literally locked in their homes and they had never been like more lonelier yeah yeah I found too that it made almost having like regularly scheduled call or FaceTime a normal thing for me because I always I don't know maybe I was just uncomfortable I didn't know how to ask people for that but I went from like oh this friend lives in a different city I'll guess I'll see them when they come visit to being like hey I miss you let's FaceTime once a week or once every month or something and like as we're kind of moving into things reopening like that is still consistent like maybe it's four months between FaceTimes, but they still happen in a way that they never happened before. Oh, I, I definitely agree with that. Like every few months, you know, I have my friends say just as you and we're just like, okay, it's time to have a, a, a Zoom call or a FaceTime call just so we can connect and hang out mm-hmm. in the capacity that we can hang out for the time being. Yes. Friends, man, they keep you going. <laughs> yep, they do. But I had one written down about this that I want to gauge your opinion on. But what are your thoughts on having a routine that make you feel at home no matter where you are so long as you keep doing them? Hmm. I think it depends on the person. You know, I really – for me, maybe not. Like I don't – I don't know. I I think that's an interesting one. I think it depends on what your routine is. For me, Mm -hmm. like – I can't think of like a daily routine for me. Well, like, but... I can I can like clarify. Okay. I definitely have touch points throughout the week of things that I do, but more of the routine I touched on is like, you know, no matter where I am, I would like wake up at the same time. I have like my skincare routine that I do before I go eat breakfast. I always have, take like a 30 minute walk a day, exercise, and then kind of at night, like do my skincare and go to bed at the same time. So it just keeps what I'm doing consistent. And maybe that's just because I need that because I'm going back and forth to my boyfriend's place a lot that I'm like, okay, while this traveling between places is happening, I still need to feel grounded. So I need to touch on these things every day. Okay. Like, yeah, I definitely see your point. And I guess I do the same thing as well, but I've I've never really connected with it in a way that like that brings me a sense of home. Mm -hmm. But I could definitely see how for some people like that would. I think maybe it's just that during the pandemic when I was living in that city apartment, I needed to break up my days with kind of like little self-care items outside of work. True. And that was like a time where that place really did become my home because I was given permission to just be and exist. So it almost reminds me when I do those things of a time where I did feel like I was rooted and belonged. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I can definitely see. Yeah. It gives me a very cozy feeling. Okay. So we got there. We got to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So yeah, one of my last points, and maybe you can relate to this. I don't know. Maybe I relate 
to this a little bit as well, but are there mm-hmm. any like keepsakes or things that you hang on to to keep your sense of home? Or Why are we like- literally the same person? Oh, see, I knew you were going to have this on your list. <laughs> this is literally my last point too. Why are we the same person? <laughs> But yes, I I also had that written down. I had kind of keepsakes and also traditions. Yeah, traditions I think are key. Like not so much maybe physical tokens, Mm -hmm. but traditions. Hey, maybe traditions relate to the routine. Yes. (laughs) Do you have like any Christmas traditions Um, that you've held on to? Yeah, like I still go to my mom's for Christmas Mm -hmm. Day and then like my dad for Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And you know, decorating the tree and there's just the ornaments that have been there literally since I was born. Yeah. Um, And they all have great stories behind them. You know, everywhere we've traveled, my mom had this thing about going to a Christmas store and we'd be like in Belgium in July and she'd be like, there's a Christmas store. I need to get an ornament for the tree. So we need to go now. (laughs) Yeah. Like, so that's kind of like one thing in my family is like Mm -hmm. my mom would always have to get an ornament somewhere. But yeah. really over time, you know, it's like my dad and I would roll our eyes being like, oh, my God, she's tracking us to another Christmas store. Um, yeah. We we now have all these great stories when we are putting up the tree. And I know I'm very fortunate that my parents are get along very well. They just weren't very good at being married to, to each other after a while. Yes. Um, one thing that's coming to mind is like this uh, silver feather, this yeah. very large silver swan feather that's been – dipped in sparkles and silver paint and Mm -hmm. you know I know exactly where that came from in Bruges Belgium so that's definitely and you've got a lot of stories from Belgium (laughs) (laughs) that's an episode for another day (laughs) we're gonna call that one trip disasters (laughs) yes and I'm gonna put both my parents on there and I'm gonna berate them (laughs) add it to the list Laura add it to the episode list (laughs) shame shame on my parents. shame shame on my parents embarrassing 12 year old me <laughs> it's a crazy trip crazy trip yeah anyway but yeah like I guess that would be kind of a a tradition that we have and then like you know we have a manger that my mom and I always set up together and it's something that my granddad built for all of his children um mm-hmm. yeah so that's definitely you know whenever you're coming home for Christmas. That's definitely a sense of warmth and mm-hmm. not predictability, but just like very comforting. It's something that you know is coming. Yes. No matter what every year. Yes. And like mine is, I was like obsessed with Christmas when I was a kid and like still kind of am oh, yeah. in my heart. But I always like make a point and it's like become expected of me. But I always decorate the Christmas tree on either the second last weekend or the last weekend of November Mm -hmm. because I am the person that would turn on Christmas carols on November 1st. I'm sorry. Oh, I yeah. As soon as it's just – well, okay. I'm December 1st. No, no. It's November for me. Oh, God. You're one of those. Yeah, sometimes. I promise. Like, usually it's more like I don't start listening to them until I set up the tree now. But when I was younger, definitely on November 1st. (laughs) It's like literally my thing Mm -hmm. where anybody in my family is like, Rachel's going to decorate the tree. Yeah. So that's definitely a tradition that makes me feel at home. And like, as I'm kind of moving forward and thinking of moving in with my boyfriend in the future, like, he really likes Christmas too. So we're like, okay, we'll get a Christmas tree and that can be our thing. Mm -hmm. is decorating it in November, right? Yeah, and I think that's very important what you just said there is, you know, you don't have to say goodbye to these traditions when you move out of your family home or things change in your life. You Mm -hmm. can carry them on and start start the tradition in a new space. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of like physical things that I've kept. And one quirky thing, I don't know, maybe a lot of people do this, is I actually keep a little scrap box. And I do too. I keep like all – like if anyone gives me a card, it is in this mm-hmm. box. And yeah. I will like write the year on it. And obviously I, I know who it's from. And it's – I don't know if it's really like a sense of home thing for me. But it's more something that I know one day I will look back on it. Mm-hmm. And you know one day some of those people aren't going to be there anymore. Yeah. 
So I don't know why. That's kind of a weird thing to to hang on to. Um, Okay, he's going to kill me if I tell him this. I I have like love letters from my boyfriend and they were in there. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, so like if anyone writes me a note or a card, I have it in a box. Yeah, it just provides such a nice way to like if you feel disconnected or lonely or something is like you can go back to old parts of yourself that felt at home and loved and you can kind of like bring that feeling in yeah and that makes sense and there's stories to go along with it too because like okay I have this birthday card that my dad got me Mm -hmm. and he the next birthday he got me the exact same card (laughs) Oh, and I brought it up to him because I had the card from last year. Yeah, so I, I showed him the card. I'm like, Dad, you got me the same birthday card, and I swear he oh bought them in bulk because he's like, Oh, I thought it was a really great card, so you know, I got it again. Um, and then I was at my sister's oh my house, and the same card. <laughs> Wasn't no. it? Our birthdays are like kind of close together, and yeah, I swear the man bought this card, this like box of cards that were all just like this one cat birthday card. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, it's like stuff like that that I just love to think about and remember because I have those cards. I have like a bunch of the exact same card all from my dad in consecutive years. Yeah. So, yeah, there's just, you know, that makes me happy. Yeah. It's fun to like look at them because it's kind of like you forget that it's there. And then like if you're moving stuff around in your room or something or you're packing something up, you stumble across it and you're like, oh, let's just go down memory lane for a second. Yeah. And I think it it really is just keeping those memories because that's what reminds you of home Mm -hmm. and makes you feel comfortable. You know, photos for me are another huge thing. I mean, you've you've seen my photo albums that I have laying around and my little boxes of pictures. Um, even on my desk right now, I'm looking at them. I have all like, you know, great horses that have been in my life over the past 20 years. And mm-hmm. those those are other things that just trigger memories for me. And remember, like, yeah. it just remind me of happy times. And it's almost like happy times. That's my home. Yep. And like you and I are definitely still figuring it out because we're still in the process of landing. But, you know, like definitely our sense of home when we're 35 is probably going to be very different, but it'll be fun to have this moment in time documented as an episode to kind of go back and be like, all right, they were figuring it out. Yeah. But we made it. Yeah. Like, oh, great. Like, you know, they were both, you know, half living with their parents. They were trying to live with their significant others. They were trying to break Mm -hmm. it, be on their own. So yeah, I hope when in a few years when we listen back on this, we've landed wherever we are, even if that's yep. just another temporary thing before the next thing in our lives. But as long yep. as we are carrying that sense of home with us, then it's all good. We're always going to be home. Watch us be in New Zealand with our cat cafe horse trekking surf shop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we can only dream. We can only, we can only dream. We'll make yes. it. <laughs> yeah. If anyone in New Zealand wants a business partner, hey. <laughs> Hit us we, up. We have a great idea. We have a really great one, and we do have the vision. It's more we don't understand the mechanics of how it's going to work. Yeah. How do we put this into a business plan that makes sense? Somebody hit us up and help us out. Thank you. Yeah, it really is our grand retirement plan, so we'd appreciate some help on that. Yes. We're tired out here. <laughs> It's cold. It's cold. We're tired. I don't like the snow. No. But yeah, home. That's a tough one to define as a young adult. But I think as time goes on, you start to learn more about how home is where the heart is. You took the words right out of my mouth. And with that, live like tea. Live like tea.